Today we are kicking off a new message series called Summer Psalms. Uh, So over the next seven weeks, we're going to walk through some of our favorite psalms, some of the psalms that we feel like God is directing us towards to share with you. I get to preach the first two weeks of those seven, and then I'm going to be on sabbatical for the last five weeks of those. Now during that time, uh, I'm on sabbatical and Angie's on sabbatical, but the church is not on sabbatical. We will continue to meet. We will continue to worship, we will continue to serve, we'll continue to do all the things that God has called us to do. We have a wonderful pastoral staff um, that is going to step in and lead in all of those areas and do a great job. So um, if I don't answer my phone or respond to my emails, that's why I'm not mad at you, I'm just hiding from you. Um, right? Not, not really. I'm resting. Resting. That's, that's what we're doing. But um, it's going to be really good. I'm excited for this series. We've got, so I'm going to do the first two weeks, and then we have Clifton Talbert, uh, Kareem Katia, Rubens Cunha, Amy Byler, and Chris Godfrey are going to speak in that order. And so actually the, the inspiration for this series uh, came a couple months ago probably. I was on a Zoom, a Zoom call that Tim Lyons, one of our members, had put together for some Tulsa area business leaders, and Clifton Talbert was the speaker on that day, and he spoke uh, from Psalms about unity. And it was just one of those, yeah, have you ever had a moment where you've listened to a sermon or a message and you've thought, I know a lot of people that need to hear this, right? Now, I was listening for myself first, uh, but I thought, I know a lot of people that need to hear this. So, so I thought, well, definitely when I'm on sabbatical, I'm going to see if Clifton can preach one of those weeks. And as he said yes, and, and then there are just a couple other moments along the way where it felt like God just kept directing me back to the Psalms. And, and so it felt like a very good way for us to add some cohesiveness to those five weeks and also give um, each speaker some freedom just to say, hey, whatever the Lord is saying to you uh, about, about our church, about uh, where we are, about what he wants to do in us or through us or for us uh, from the Psalms, we want to encourage you to share those. So it's going to be great. Hope you're going to be here. Today we're going to start in Psalm 109 and talk about what it means to be honest. Now, Psalm 109 would not necessarily have been my personal preference uh, for a psalm to preach from. I would have enjoyed Psalm 23. Uh, You know, I would have enjoyed some of the other psalms, some of the messianic psalms, some of the psalms that talk about God's provision, God's deliverance, those sorts of things. As we get into Psalm 109 this morning, you'll see why it is one of the least preached psalms in the Bible. Um, it's a psalm that talks about, uh, you know, you hope your enemy that his wife is widowed and his children are fatherless, and uh, it just it gets pretty dark pretty fast. Uh, there'll definitely be a few moments where you'll stop and think, that's in the Bible? Interesting. Uh, but it also kind of invites us to consider this idea of life is hard, and when life is hard, we don't always necessarily respond in the best ways. We don't say the best things. Um, but God is big enough and strong enough to handle that. So we can be totally honest with him about where we are and what we're going through. And then we can also be honest about who God is in the middle of those kind of circumstances. All right? So uh, just survey to make sure we're all on the same page. Who has ever said something they regretted when they were frustrated, angry, or hurt? Okay. Who did that this week? Who did that this morning? Yeah, not as many. Some of you are like, put your hand, you were rude, right? That's all right, just relax. Hey, we're all in the same boat. We're all on the same page. So we'll just jump right in. Psalm 109, we're gonna work through it just kind of a couple verses at a time. The first thing we see is in verses one through five, the psalmist is gonna talk to us about being honest about the source of our pain. In verse one, he says, my God whom I praise, do not remain silent. For people who are wicked and deceitful have opened their mouths against me. They have spoken against me with lying tongues. With words of hatred they surround me. They attack me without cause. In return for my friendship, they accuse me. But I am a man of prayer. They repay me evil for good and hatred for my friendship. Now the psalm is a prayer to be delivered from your enemies. The psalmist is writing about real people who are inflicting real harm on him. His enemies are not uh, theories or ideas that are out there. They are people with names and faces who live in places that he has seen, he's visited. They're affecting the course of his daily life. And his first concern is that God will remain silent in the midst of his suffering. 
Right? So from the beginning, we're not only going to be honest about the source of our pain, but we're going to be honest about some of the fears that come in seasons of pain. And when things go bad, one of our first fears is God doesn't see, care, or hear. That my circumstances are proof of his absence, or perhaps worse, proof that he is judging me and giving me these things as punishment. The psalmist goes on, though, to describe how we feel when we're persecuted, when there's no legitimate way for us to free ourselves. The, the injustice that he describes is something that most of us are probably unfamiliar with. Right now, now on one level, we, we're familiar with it. If we all know what it is to be hurt, to be harmed by someone else. And yet to, to suffer at the level he has where you're being unjustly persecuted by your enemies with no legitimate hope for deliverance or justice is a space that many of us have not quite found ourselves in. But if you've ever sustained those kinds of lingering, prolonged attacks, you will identify with every aspect of Psalm 109. But as we work through it, we'll see it's not just a cry for God to curse our enemies, but ultimately it's a cry for justice. It's a cry that God will recognize the injustice of the world and he will act to make things right. It's one of those psalms that in your annual Bible reading plan, you probably uh, kind of plow right through it. You don't give a whole lot of thought to it. Maybe a line or two catches your attention. But when you're suffering, and especially when you're suffering at the hands of someone else with no hope of relief, Psalm 109 becomes very real and very powerful. As we stand at the beginning of another week of Royal Family Kids Camp, I think Psalm 109 is one that many of our campers would identify with. Now, the, the qualifications for a child to be placed in foster care are never pleasant. Not all of them are victims of abuse. Sometimes they have just tragically lost their parents. But for the vast majority of children in foster care, there's been some form of abuse, abandonment, or neglect. And in those settings, whether they can put it into words or not, whether they've ever, ever read Psalm 109 or not, they identify when he says, with words of hatred, they surround me. They attack me without cause. In return for my friendship, they accuse me. They repay me evil for good and hatred for friendship. See, when a, a child is abused, abandoned, neglected by someone who's supposed to love, protect, and care for them, it creates real and lasting trauma. And so one of the functions of royal family is, first of all, to acknowledge these terrible injustices are occurring in the world, and they're causing real pain and real damage. And so where we're at this week is we're kind of on the backside of, hey, the problems have happened, now let's try to be part of God's healing process. But as you read through Psalm 109, again, we see it's not just a cry for God, deliver me, it's also a cry for justice. And justice means not only, God, stop this from happening to me, but God, keep this from happening again. And so royal family, we are on the backside of care, on the other side of the problem. But what we want to remember this morning is as followers of Jesus, we're called to be people of justice, people who speak out against injustice, people who stand in opposition to evil. And so, yes, we're going to care for those who've been harmed, but we're also going to do our best in whatever capacity we can, wherever God has placed us, to make sure these things don't keep happening. So whether that's as a law enforcement officer, if that's as a, a lawyer, a medical professional, a social worker, an educator, a, a ministry leader, in whatever capacity God has placed you, you not only have a responsibility to care for those who've been harmed, but you also have a responsibility to prevent future injustices from occurring. And so we're going to engage with parents who are in need. We're going to reach out to children who seem on the verge, right? We're going to enter into these spaces. Psalm 109 reminds us not just that God hears us when we suffer, but also that we have a responsibility to others who are suffering. We have a responsibility to others, especially those who are powerless and are unable to defend or protect themselves. And so, so we're being invited to be honest about the source of our pain. It's not just, Lord, life's kind of uncomfortable. It's there's some very real things, and we can name them, and we can point to them, and we can talk to God about them. And then in verses 6 through 20, we get the, the more expanded description of exactly what that pain has done to us and how we react to it, right? So, so, so some of this here um, is one of those you can't believe it's in the Bible kind of prayers, 
unless you've ever suffered in painful and unjust ways, and, and some of you, as we read through this, you're going to say, yeah, I prayed that. Prayed that yesterday for him by name, right? And what did you pray? Here's what you prayed. Appoint someone evil to oppose my enemy. So we've escalated quickly here, right? We, we have moved past, Lord, deliver me, to God, send someone worse than him to get after him, all right? Appoint someone evil to oppose my enemy. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him be found guilty, and may his prayers condemn him. May his days be few. May another take his place of leadership. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children be wandering beggars. May they be driven from their ruined homes. I don't know about you, but if I walk in the room and my wife is praying this prayer out loud, I'm like, first of all, not me, right? (laughs) Secondly, what happened to you? Who hurt you to provoke? Like this isn't, he's not just sitting down thinking, I'm just going to see what comes out. Like this comes from a place of real hurt and real pain and the filter's off. And he just keeps going. May a creditor seize all he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his labor. May no one extend kindness to him or take pity on his fatherless children. May his descendants be cut off, their names blotted out from the next generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord. May the sin of his mother never be blotted out. May their sins always remain before the Lord, that he may blot out their name from the earth. So we have went from, Lord, uh, send someone evil to accuse him to uh, don't forget about his mama. She was a horrible woman. Don't forget about his dad. He was even worse than he was. Like, it, it's an escalating description of this person has caused so much pain, and it's just coming out louder and louder and louder. And then he gives a description of who this person is and how they approach life. He says in verse 16, for he never thought of doing a kindness, but hounded to death the poor and the needy and the brokenhearted. He loved to pronounce a curse. May it come back on him. He found no pleasure in blessing. May it be far from him. He wore cursing as his garment. It entered into his body like water, into his bones like oil. May it be like a cloak wrapped about him, like a belt tied forever around him. May this be the Lord's payment to my accusers, to those who speak evil of me. Now again, we're invited in Psalm 109 to be honest about our reaction to the pain. It's not just that we're going to acknowledge it, but we're also going to acknowledge, Lord, this is how I feel about it. It's the raw reaction of a wounded soul. It's not just a Lord deliver me. It's not just a Lord grant me justice. It's a Lord crush my enemies. I mean, in some really violent language, honestly, the psalmist is describing the pain that we feel. And for some of us, the thought of praying this way is, is impossible because we, we've just been taught or we've somehow adopted this idea of before I pray, I need to clean it up. And, in, and you'll see this in your life because think about the difference between the way you talk about your problems and the way you pray about your problems. Think about the names you call that person when you talk about them and the names you call them when you pray about them. Right over here, you're praying names, you're calling them names you don't want your kids to hear. And then over here, like, Lord, bless your child. Help him to see the error of his ways. And over here, you're like, that dirty. And you just, you go down the line, right? You have to wash your own mouth out with soap when you're done. And yet there's this gap between where we refuse to be fully honest with God in our prayers. And what the psalmist is teaching us is God already sees it, knows it, and hears it when you say it. So you might as well bring it to him in complete honesty. Right? And, and if you're not, then what you're actually doing, Jesus will tell us in Matthew chapter 5, if there's a difference in the way you talk about something and the way you pray about something, you're not praying to God, you're praying for performance. You're praying for public consumption. You're praying so others will respect you, so you can tell yourself you're a better version than you really are. But if you're going to be honest, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5, he says, when you pray... Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. What's Jesus telling us? He's telling us, look, when you pray, you need to consider a private conversation behind closed doors with your Father. And in that space, you can be totally honest. 
See, for some of us this morning, the reason you can't get past your pain is you won't be honest about it with Jesus. You keep trying to dress it up. You keep trying to deny it. You keep trying to make it better than what it is. A couple years ago, um, I was going through a a painful season of life, and I was talking with a a friend of mine who's a counselor. And so he's kind of talking me through, you know, hey, what's going on? How's it affecting you? And and is it, you know, is is what's happening here? Is it filtering into your marriage? Is it filtering into your family? Is it filtering into your friendships? And, and, uh, you know, I was telling him, I don't don't think so. Um, He asked me, are you being honest with people? I'm like, yes, I have some people to be honest with. He said, well, there's always a next level of honesty. So he told me, when you get home or back to the office today, get out a piece of paper and write down everything you think about the situation you're going through. Um, and he said, don't, don't worry about it. No one's ever going to see it. You're going to turn it. You're going to tear it up and throw it away when it's done. So use whatever language comes to mind. You, now I'm like, hey, you don't understand who I am. I am the grandson of Norma Dow. And if I said, dang it, there was soap coming my way. <laughs> my mom thought but was a cuss word, <laughs> right? We couldn't say gosh or golly because they were too close to using the Lord's name in vain. You can't tell me to write down whatever comes into my mind because I take every, ca- every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. You can't tell me to do that. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. I cannot do that. And he, he just kind of gently, not so gently, honestly, he's like, Chris, go and do it. No one's going to see it until you're honest. You're not going to find healing and wholeness. I wish what he would have told me because it would have carried a little more weight was just go read Psalm 109. Right? You're not going to say anything worse than what's in there. You're probably not wishing for fatherless children on the people who've hurt your feelings. No, I'm not. I just want to call them bad words, right? You know, and so, but in that process, what he was teaching me was God already saw it and already knew it. And if it's in my heart, he knows it. And it's in my mind, he's seen it. And if it comes out of my mouth, he hears it. So I might as well go into a private place. I know Jesus is not saying, hey, go on the street corner and bear your soul about everyone around you. And then when they get mad, be like, hey, I was praying, shut up. No, he says, go into your closet, shut the door, and pray. And it's just between you and God. And what what Psalm 109 is teaching us, what Jesus is trying to teach us, is prayer should always be honest and authentic. And it's at its most powerful when it's personal and when it's private. And in those personal and private prayers, you can be honest with God. And, And so that pushes us to another level that some of us have to consider is the reason we are not honest and authentic in our prayers is because we never have personal and private prayers. We only pray in public. We only pray when we're gathered in church. We only pray when somebody asks us to. We only pray over a meal. And prayer is such an irregular part of our life that personal and private and honest prayers just, it has no ability, no potential to intervene. So make prayer a regular part of your life. Make honest prayer a part of your life. But in doing so, make it private between you and the Lord. And what you'll discover is God is big enough to handle anything you bring to him. We we think sometimes, I can't say that because God doesn't want to hear it. Or I can't say that because God has enough problems, he doesn't need mine. Anybody ever done that? I've got some real problems, but there's other people around me with bigger problems, so I shouldn't bother the Lord. Somebody asks you, is there anything I can pray with you about? And there's there's a list of 10 things, but you're like, no, pray for them, theirs is bigger. But Psalm Psalm 109 is not about other people's problems. It's about your problems. And you have to bring your problems to the Lord. And that means you've got to change and understand. He already sees it, knows it, and hears it, so you might as well say it. Say it privately and say it personally in prayer. And then understand nothing you say is going to be too big for him. A couple weeks ago, I was listening to a a podcast, and they were interviewing a man named Dr. Terry Wardle, who writes a lot about um, mental health for ministry leaders. And one of the things that, that he was talking about, he was talking to pastors, which is why I was listening to it. He said that um, ministry is kind of a, a series of ungrieved losses. And that pastors, as much as we walk other people through grief, we're not very good at handling grief on our own. Uh, and, and he made this statement that, that it's one of those things that, have you ever had that where you know it, but then someone else says it in such a compelling way, it feels like you've heard it for the first time. He said, our grief is a grain of sand and God is the ocean. Our grief is not going to push him around. I mean, you think of the biggest, most difficult, most challenging problem you have, and it's a grain of sand to the Lord. That doesn't mean he doesn't care, doesn't mean he doesn't see, doesn't mean he doesn't have a plan. It just means there is never anything you're going through that is going to push him off center. 
There's never anything you're going through that he's going to think, I don't know how to handle that. I don't know how to help them. But you can bring it all to him. And as we keep reading through the psalm, we see that this is where the psalmist arrives. In verse 22, he says, For I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. So he's moving us now from the external to the internal. And inviting us, to be honest, not just about the circumstances, but about the internal effect that they are having on us. Right? He's aware that external trauma creates internal trauma. It's one of the things that, that we see at Royal Family Kids Camp, of kids who've been abandoned, abused, and neglected. It not only has physical effects, but it has mental, emotional, has spiritual effects. What happens to our bodies always affects our souls. And so the psalmist is leading us into the style of prayer where we're not just saying, Lord, change my circumstances, but we're also saying, Lord, protect, preserve, and save my heart. Make sure the spring stays pure. And so this is why it's important for us to be honest in our prayers. It's why it's important for us to be honest about our situation. You can't handle it, but God can. And so for as long as you bring it to him, when life is hard, when it's difficult, when you're suffering unjust persecution, when you're being treated unfairly, when you feel like the psalmist, I'm being pursued everywhere I go, I'm offering friendship and I'm receiving hatred. What he's saying is in that space, that will have an internal impact on you. And if you don't deal with it, that internal impact will then begin to have an external impact on those around you. So when we come to the Lord and we're honest about our pain, we're honest about our suffering, our frustration, our bitterness, our anger, our rage, our jealousy, whatever it might be, when you come in prayer and you're honest about those, it's hard for things to take root in your soul that are continually being surrendered to the Lord. And so if you're going to come in prayer and say, Lord, I'm angry, Lord, I'm jealous, Lord, I'm insecure, Lord, I'm scared, Lord, I'm full of fear. In all of these things, if, you're, if every day, several times a day, you're taking them out of your heart and giving them to the Lord, they have a really hard time taking root in your soul. But if you refuse to do that, they will get all bound up inside of you. And what harmed you in one area begins to filter into all of these other areas. So think of it from the position of a parent. You know, there are a lot of things you want to pass on to your kids. Maybe you want to give them your work ethic. Maybe you want to give them your love for others. Maybe you want to give them some of your wisdom. You want to give them a group of friends like you have. I don't know what it is, but there's also some things we don't want to pass on to our children, right? And at the top of that list that we don't want to pass on is we don't want to pass on our pain. But we're going to if we don't deal with it. If you don't deal with it, your children, they're going to get your fear. They're going to get your anger. They're going to get your lack of ability to trust. They're going to get your fear that everyone's out to get you and take what's yours. And if you don't deal with what's inside of you, you're going to pass it on. It's going to take root. It's going to grow. It's going to be magnified. And you have the potential to create some generational cycles of destruction in your family because you refuse to be honest with the Lord about what's going on in your heart. But if you'll be honest... And say, Lord, I not only need you to change my circumstances, but I need you to protect my heart. He will come, and he will work, and he will deliver, and he will heal. Right? This, is, this is our hope at Royal Family Kids Camp. Now, we're not a therapeutic camp. Right? We're, we're not trained professionals. Everybody goes through training, so they know the, the proper way to interact and do all these sorts of things. But we're not licensed counselors. And so what, what we're going to do is provide a lot of external fun. We're going to swim, and we're going to fish, and we're going to have activities and crafts, and we're going to eat kind of good food, and we're, you know, we're going to do all of these kinds of things that you do at camp. And it's all external stuff, but our hope, our prayer, our belief, and what we've seen over 23 years is the external opens the door to the internal. And those kids, whether it's at night when you're praying with them before they go to bed, if it's in a walk from the chapel down to the river, at some point the internal door opens and they start to ask questions. And we can step into that space and begin to talk to them about, hey, God can heal your heart. He's healed mine. Here's what he did for me. Here's some of the dark things I went through and have endured. And here's how God was with me. And what our hope is, is that as God works internally, those cycles of abuse, abandonment, and neglect end with these children. That they not only find hope and healing and salvation for them, but they write a totally different story 
for their kids and the generations that follow. For all of us who follow Jesus, we can look back in our family tree, and at some point there was a family member who made a decision that changed the trajectory of our families. If you look back and you say, I don't have that, then that person's you. You're the one that they're going to say, my grandpa, my great-grandma, she did this, he did that, and things were different. What happened there? People decided, I'm not satisfied with just praying about the external. I need to pray about the internal. And as God works and moves, it changes the trajectory of individuals, of families, of generations of people. But we have to come from that position of, you know what I'm not going to pass on to my kids? I'm not going to pass on my pain. I'm not going to pass on my hurt. And the only way I can avoid that is by surrendering it to the Lord. Because if I stuff it, it's going to come out. And then the the psalmist, he, he starts to wind down by reminding us where our hope is. He tells us in verse 26, help me, God. Help me, Lord my God, save me according to your unfailing love. So this is why you can be honest with God. Because his love for you is unfailing. It's never ending. It's not based on what you do. It's not based on who you might become. It's not based on how well you pray. It's not based off of did you guard your language when you were praying to me. It's not based off of any of these things. God loves you because he created you. He loves you so much that he sent his son so you could enter into a relationship with him. And so the psalmist, his hope for ultimate deliverance, salvation, and healing does not rest in the power of his prayers, but in the presence of God's unfailing love. So he's not reminding God, hey, remember, you unfailingly love me. He's reminding himself. God, it's your unfailing love. What's unfailing love? Unfailing love means when you fail, God still loves you. Never gives up, never turns away, never gets tired of welcoming you back in. I know my, you might, I mean, we might be working through this this morning, you're thinking, this would have been great to hear 50 years ago. But I've already passed on the pain to my kids, and they're all kinds of messed up. And they passed it on to the grandkids. We're praying one of them is the person people can point to, because I'm, I'm just getting blamed for everything right now. Right? And, and if that's your spot, you might be totally right. And God's love for you is unfailing. He's not turning away. He's not angry. He's not looking to crush you. He's looking to welcome you, to heal you, to bring you into an assurance of his love. So you can be honest about your hope for healing the pain. It's not in a person. It's not in a program. It's not in some procedure you need to go through. Your ultimate hope is God's unfailing love for you. It's why you can be honest, and it's why you can have hope. And then the psalmist, he he finishes in verse 30 with this final encouragement to us. He says, with my mouth, I will greatly extol the Lord. In the great throng of worshipers, I will praise him, for he stands at the right hand of the needy to save their lives from those who would condemn them. So again, we're going to be honest, not just about our pain and our experience of it and our reaction to it, but we're going to be honest about the hope that we have in pain. And our hope, is that God will do what he's promised he will do. He said he'll never leave us or forsake us. So we're going to believe that and we're going to declare that. And he, I love the, the, the picture that Psalm 109 creates. The Lord stands at the right hand of the needy. Because what's our most common question when we're in pain, when we're suffering? God, where are you? And he, he's answering it. I'm, I'm literally right here. I'm at your right hand. I've gone before you. I'm coming behind you. I'm above and below you. I've got you surrounded on every side. Right? That's how we can pray. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me at my right hand, never leaving, never turning away, never going backwards. And, and the psalmist tells us, because of that, I will extol the Lord in the great throng of worshipers. To put that in in modern language, he's saying, I'm going to worship God with his people. Not after I've been delivered, but while I'm still needing it. 
in the middle of my grief, in the middle of my pain, in the middle of my hurt, in the middle of my suffering, in the middle of my doubts and my uncertainties. I am going to gather with the people of God to declare the glories of God. I'm going to read from the scriptures. I'm going to talk about his goodness. I'm going to sing about his healing. I'm going to hope for his salvation. I'm going to anchor myself in community while I'm waiting to remember the Lord is at my right hand. What does this mean for us practically? It means in seasons of want and need, we are to run towards the body of Christ, not away from it. And yet for so many of us, these are the first chairs that we avoid when life goes wrong. Because we live under this misconception that everyone else in here is perfect. No one there will understand. I'm the only one who's ever been laid off. I'm the only one who's ever had marriage problems. I'm the only one whose child has ever made poor decisions. I'm the only one whose parents have ever let them down. I'm the only one who's ever experienced a death in the family. I'm the only one who's had an illness that wasn't healed. I'm the only one who's been in a position of financial need. I'm the only one who's made foolish choices. I'm the only one who bears the consequences of what other people have done. I'm the only one with lingering hurt and pain and doubt and fear and depression and frustration. I'm the only one, and because I'm the only one, I might as well be alone. What the psalmist reminds us in one and I is, no, no, no. When I'm suffering and when I'm persecuted, I will extol the Lord in the great throng of worshipers. I will go and put myself right in the middle. And I will sing the songs and I will pray the prayers and I will read the scriptures. And I will believe that what God has done, he is doing and he will do. And I will remember that my circumstances do not change who he is or what he has done. That my actions cannot stop his love, but he is with me and he is for me and he is active and he is moving. This is the good news we take to Royal Family Kids Camp. This is the good news we take everywhere we go. The Lord is with us. The Lord is for us. He is at our right hand. He is working. He's moving. And so our only response is, I will sing about it. I will talk about it. I will pray about it until I know it. I believe it and I will experience it. This is the invitation of Psalm 109. Not just, hey, Lord, crush my enemies. God, heal my heart. Remind me of who you are. Bring me out of this healthy and whole and dependent on you. You can be honest. Wherever you are this morning, you can be honest. God already sees. He already knows. He's already heard. So just go ahead and enter into that conversation with him. That might be in the prayer room this morning. It might be when you go home this afternoon. It might be with a friend or a family member at another time. But be honest about where you are. And as you are, the Spirit will come and be honest with you about who God is, what God is doing, and why you have hope and why you can sing and rejoice even in the midst of suffering. Will you stand with me? I want to lead us in a final prayer this morning. The band's going to come back, and they're going to lead us in a final song. Lord, we come to you. You see every season, every situation that we're going through. You see the hurt and the pain that we have caused or that others have caused us to experience. Lord, today we come and we ask that your spirit would work and would move. Lord, give us the freedom to be honest with you about where we are and what we feel. Help us to pray authentic prayers, Lord, not just to vent and complain, but to find freedom in life. As we cry out against the injustices that we're experiencing and that we see, Lord, we have hope that you are the God of justice, that you are the God of action. You are the God who moves and works on our behalf. As we sit in seasons of grief and loss, Will you come and remind us that you are the God who draws near to the brokenhearted? Lord, as we're in a a moment where we need your provision, we need your deliverance, we need your salvation and your healing, will you come, Lord, and, and let us hear your words that you are at the right hand of the needy. You have never been closer to us than you are right now. And so, Lord, we come, we open up every part of our life, every relationship, every need, every hurt from the past, every trauma, every abuse, everything that we've endured, Lord, we lay it before you today and we pray in this space, Lord, will you heal our wounded hearts? Will you remind us of your unfailing love? Will you work and move in supernatural and miraculous ways? Lord, we don't want to just vent about our situation. 
But as we lament, we want to experience your peace and your presence. We want to know that you're here, that you hear us and that you're working. So Holy Spirit, we invite you in this morning to combat the lies that God doesn't see or doesn't care and to remind us of his unfailing love expressed to us in Jesus Christ. Jesus, we receive your presence, your power, and your transformation today. In Jesus' name, amen.